Let's get ready to give to the Lord tonight, and we'll jump in and dismiss classes. If, you, if you've uh, brought something, why don't you take that out? We're going to pray over it. Ephesians 6, 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. You know, that word wrestle is a contest between two in which one endeavors to throw the other in which one is decided the victor over to be able to hold his opponent in a pinned position or with his hand upon his neck. Well, I think that's a pretty good definition of wrestling, right? We're called not to wrestle against humanity, but we wrestle against spiritual forces that are trying to stop the purposes of God. And we are called to be the victor in Jesus' name. That's the truth. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Do you believe that? All right, three of you, that's awesome. We have a great shot at victory with that. All right, <laughs> let's, uh, let's lift that up to the Lord. Father, tonight we thank you for, Lord, your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you that we're able to give to you. Lord, every time we come into the house of the Lord, Lord, something of joy should be sparked inside of us of a gratefulness. And Lord, we don't want to give you nothing. We always come with a heart of thanksgiving and simply to respond to you. Lord, lovingly tonight, we give our tithes and our offerings by faith. We pray for our first fruits, those that have partnered with you in that, Lord, that you would continue to release seed, to come to them, Lord, to provide for what you spoke in their ear. Lord, we pray for our missionaries tonight, Lord, that you would encourage them, strengthen them. Lord, give them the grace to keep doing the work that they're doing in the country that you've called them to. We ask you now for all all of this in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You can give tonight. Hello, Thanks. Life Bible Church family. Thank you so much for your continued faithfulness to give. There are two different ways you can give. You can go to our website, lifebiblechurch.org, and give there, or you can simply mail your check here to the church to the address on the screen. Thank you again so much. And now back to the service. In the meantime, while you keep your hands up, I'm going to go ahead and uh, before we get started here, uh, I think I'll actually read the articles and then I'll pray to cleanse ourselves and then we'll move on into the reality. <clears throat> so, obviously we haven't had class for a couple of weeks and every time we do that we get a plethora of news articles and I don't even know which ones to share to be honest with you. I pulled a few off of uh, the the internet today from various sources, and I pulled a lot from the last couple of weeks, and we'd be here all class, me just reading bad news. So let me just uh, read a few things that are, anybody else need page or chapter 11 notes? Okay, did you get yours, Molly? Okay, perfect. You guys need notes? Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so here's the first article. U.S. USA raises pride flag on building at the Holy See. United States Embassy to the Holy See in Italy, at the Vatican, raised a pride flag on Wednesday to commemorate the beginning of Pride Month. The Holy See is a district, sovereign entity, separate, but related to both the Papacy and the Vatican City. The Holy See is a worldwide jurisdiction of the Pope, made up both of a city-state, a Vatican City, and pontiff's ecclesiastic authority. The U.S. has maintained diplomatic relations with the Holy See ever since the presidency of George Washington. The official social media accounts for the U.S. Embassy to the Holy See boasted of their celebration of Pride Month on Wednesday, posting a photo of a rainbow banner adorning their historic office building in Rome. Raising the Pride banner is a notable decision due to Catholic Church historic disapproval of homosexual practices. 
says, today is the start of Pride Month. The United States respects and promotes equality, human dignity of all people, including LGBTQIA and community, said the embassy. According to the moral teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, same-sex attraction itself is not a sin, but that all human beings are deserving of dignity regardless of race, creed, gender, sexual orientation. However, sodomy and other homosexual acts are considered a grave travesty by the church and maintains that under no circumstance should they be approved. Homosexual persons are called to chastity, says the Catechism of Catholic Church, by the virtues of self-mastery that teach them inner freedom, and at times by the support of disinterested friendship, by prayer and sacramental grace, they should gradually and resolutely approach Christian perfection. The, uh, the Catechism of the Catholic Church is the universal summary of the explanation of Catholic teaching. It is meant to be the final reference point for established Catholic doctrine. Pride Month, however, is an opportunity for the honored the histo history of LGBTQIA community and their fight for equality, said U.S. Trade Representative Ambassador Catherine Tai said the White House statement on Wednesday, 53 years after Stonewall, we still have not fully realized a world free of violence and prejudice against LGBTQIA plus people. President Biden and the entire Biden-Harris administration are committed to ending discrimination, hate, bigotry of our fellow citizens. The statement continued and it is why on this first day in office, Biden signed executive orders to advance equality in policy and prohibit discrimination in the federal workforce on the basis of gender identity and sexual orientation. The U.S. Embassy's decision to fly the pride flag is only the latest of a growing cultural clash between the Roman Catholic Church and America and U.S. civil government. Okay? All right. Nothing like... Guess you can't say the statement when in Rome. All right, moving on. Uh, the article, here's an article. The View TV show co-host blames, and the reason I'm saying this is I think you need to understand where all of this is headed. The View co-host blames Christian nationalism for mass shootings. Today, co-hosts of the ABC View rallied against Republicans over their support of parental rights Laws Friday claiming that the party's platform isn't aligned with American values, accusing it of targeting marginalized people. On Tuesday, ABC's View, I guess it was yesterday, uh, Tara Setmeyer blamed the Uvalde school shooting on a rise in violent Christian nationalism. It's part of the Christian nationalism. This rise in violent Christian nationalism, we've seen it, which is also disturbing. They use biblical principles. They pervert them to justify this, particularly in Texas. It's a growing movement. It's God's guns and Trump, or it's God guns and whatever as part of their ethos. Setemeyer, who serves as a senior advisor for the anti-Republican group, The Lincoln Project, was filling in as a guest for a longtime conservative on the show. Co-host Goldberg added that Sotomayor's point, blaming Christians for slavery and racism. It's always been this. It's the way it was down south. They used the Bible to say you're not people. God doesn't see you as people, so you don't, we don't see you as people, Goldberg said. Then they went on to call for the banning of AR-15s. We don't care about the NRA. Uh, it's not a hunting gun, blah, 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 blah. Conversation was sparked when uh, one of the hosts criticized Daniel Defense, a gun manufacturer, for a deleted tweet that featured a child holding an unloaded gun with a biblical verse attached to it. The View's comments reflect a pattern by some of the media to label Christianity as a vehicle for violence and white supremacy. Last month, the Time magazine published an article titled, It's Time to Stop Giving Christianity a Pass on White Supremacy and Violence. Similarly, the LA Times calling this sham Christians or slammed Christians, excuse me, for who turned to faith in response to the Uvalde shooting, accusing them of supporting a return to the kind of faith that allowed brutal enslavement to be the law of the land for centuries. Anyway, that's, that's the narrative, guys. The narrative is, let's turn the attention and blame it on the Christians. And that's the next wave of persecution that's coming. Uh, regardless of the politics, this is where this thing is headed because certainly can't blame yourself for the politics that you've created. You've got to find a scapegoat, all right? I thought this was interesting. We talked about this just maybe a month and a half, two months ago. Treasury Secretary 
Janet Yellen concedes she was wrong on the path inflation would take. Imagine that. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen admitted that she had failed to anticipate how long and how high inflation would continue to plague the American consumers as the Biden administration works on mounting, uh, on, on mounting political liability. I think I was wrong. You think? Uh, when about the path that inflation would take, Yellen said on the Wolf Blitzer show in the Situation Room when asked about her comments that inflation posed only a small risk. The administration was the latest, the admission was the latest indication that the administration's expectations for a normalizing economy were thrown into disarray by continued pandemic and the war in Europe. As I mentioned, there have been unanticipated large shocks to the economy that have boosted energy and food prices and supply bottlenecks that affected our economy badly that at the time, well, at the time I didn't fully understand, but we do recognize those now. <laughs> uh, anyway, that was that one. I just thought that was interesting that uh, we all said that it was coming. I think I told you the article. I said, don't believe that. It's going to proofs in the pudding. We haven't seen the end of it yet. Just by the way, folks, don't, don't let the media give you the narrative. Be wiser than that. Look, just take a topical view. Listen, you, 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 you can hardly, and I, I say this carefully, you can hardly believe anything that's in all news sources. You have to actually, if you're going to believe anything, you have to research almost everything. Honestly. I mean, literally, I, I, I spend hours every week just to find the facts from a variety, plethora of sources, just so that I can talk with some form of, of, of um, truth uh, that actually has some bearing of truth. But if you just go off a news program, you're getting duped in some measure and fashion constantly, constantly. All right. Here's another one that you might have saw. North Carolina preschool uses LGBT flashcards depicting a pregnant man to teach the kids colors. A North Carolina preschool used flashcards featuring LGBTQ themes to teach kids colors, including one card depicting a pregnant man. Schools should be only using age appropriate materials and these flashcards clearly don't meet that standard for a preschool classroom said one of the state representatives in North Carolina. Whew. Pierre said concerned constituent emailed her about the cards that were being used to teach preschoolers the colors. We're not talking about like red, yellow, black, white, green. They were using LGBTQ symbols or emojis to teach the colors. Crazy. Anyway, I just, I thought you should know that that's happening, okay? Here's another one. Iran's enriched uranium, now 18 times more than nuclear deals limit. <clears throat> the International Atomic Energy Agency said earlier this month that Iran has accumulated a stockpile of of enriched uranium more than 18 times the limit set out in the nuclear deal signed in 2015. And you remember who signed that? John Kerry and Barack Obama as their signature plan, paying them over a billion dollars, which everyone in the world said that will, they will never adhere to. Surprise, surprise, here we are, 18 times that limit deal. Anyways, moving on for that. They actually have uh, enough uranium to not just make one missile, but multiple, multiple, multiple missiles. All right? Here's one that hits a little close to home. Burnout Catholic exorcists complain they face long line of possessed people with little support from bishops. I feel their pain. Uh, <laughs> uh, the survey from Vatican-approved religious university in Rome found that Catholic exorcists feel overwhelmed and undersupported by bishops, according to the London Times. The Italian exorcist spoke to researchers at Regina's Apostolorium 16th anniversary 
annual, excuse me, 16th annual exorcism course on Rome that were attended by 120 participants. The course attracted a significant crowd thanks to Pope Francis' support of exorcism. He previously spoken about helping those who were possessed by evil and made exorcism an official Catholic practice according to the Independent. The conference's exorcists said they need more support from psychologists to determine whether people are mentally unstable or demonically possessed. Father Guspi Bernardi, Father Guspi Bernardi, claimed to have <laughs> performed a nine-hour exorcism on a woman who hurled abuse in Latin and assaulted the monks during the session. The woman's father thought she was suffering from a psychiatric problem, but later Bernardi believed that she was possessed with a demonic influence. Bernardi said he had, had to seek help from the psychologist to determine whether she was deserved, disturbed or possessed, but without the help of the church, things are backlogging severely. Many are complaining about receiving very little help. Exorcists said they've been tasked with con conducting exorcisms on people, even with COVID-19, say it isn't so, and recognize that their participants in the conference claim demonic possessions could be recognized by unusual physical strength, vomiting, and sudden ability to speak in Latin, Hebrew, or Aramaic without learning the languages. Italy has 290 exorcists, and there are 37 in Spain. The survey found many of potential people they see in Spain have spent much time with New Age, spiritual, or meditation groups. In the UK and Ireland, there are 28 working exorcists, and in Manila, Philippines, there was a dedicated office and a team strictly for it. Isn't that interesting? Things are, things are growing and growing and growing. Last one, and then we'll pray and get into it. Scientists, <laughs> and this is from the Science Robotic and Science Robotics Journal and Southwest News Service contributed to this report. Robotic crab, tinier than flea, becomes the smallest ever remote controlled robot. So they had a picture of this. I could just show you a picture of it. Had a picture of a penny. And that penny on the top of the rim had this robotic, of the rim of a penny had this robotic crab that would fit within the rim of a penny, smaller than a flea. So I'll read the article. Miniature robotic crab, tinier than a flea, has become the smallest ever robot, remote controlled robot. Measuring just a half millimeter wide, it can walk, bend, twist, turn, even jump. The remarkable record-breaking micro-machine was developed by engineers at Northwest Un University in the form of a tiny peekaboo crab. The same team developed millimeter-sized robots representing inchworms, crickets, and beetles. So this is the, I'm going to stop here. Um, let me just, let me read this a little bit more and then I'll give you some more. Although research is exploratory at the moment, they believe technology might bring the field of robotics closer to realizing micro-sized robots can perform practical tasks inside tightly confined spaces. Research have also produced winged microchips last year of the smallest ever human-made flying structure. So what are we saying here? We're saying that uh, without going... Um, I don't want you to use the word conspiracy theory because that's not where I'm going here. But you can't make things tinier than a flea that can send and receive information, spy, have commands, receive commands. These things are now going to emulate certain things in nature. They will be everywhere. It's pretty, pretty crazy. So if you, if, you, if you can, I mean, you can't even hardly see a flea. And to say that it's smaller than a flea? I'm going to need a next sec another pair of these glasses just to find out what's watching us. All right, anyways, um, I just thought it would be um, just interesting for you to hear that as technology is moving in so many facets that they can... Um, this was uh, the, sci the journal of... of <laughs> where is it? The journal... Science Robotics Journal. So, I thought, I thought uh, we'll stop there. I've got too many articles we're doing here. Um, I thought it was just interesting, you know. I mean, we are, uh, without getting 
too deep because we are in the Revelation class so we can talk about some of these deep things. When we talk about a uh, controlled state of the Antichrist where, you know, the reality is as we're getting into these chapters where nobody can buy or sell without the mark. You know, it won't just be about the mark. It will be about surveillance at every level. So please don't fool yourself thinking, well, I just won't take it. They won't know anything. They'll know lots of things. If they can hide receptors in the size of a flea, uh, that's uh, pretty much anywhere. Um, Anyway, moving on. Let's take a look at the book of God's Word and pull ourselves out of (laughs) depression here and on the hope of what God says is going to happen. Amen? All right, Revelation 11. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word of God. It is the truth. The Bible is the whole truth. Lord, we believe in absolute truth. You are absolute and you are absolute truth. There's no one that can diminish you. There's no one. Those scoffers and fools alike try to mock you. Lord, you sit, as it says in Proverbs 1, or excuse me, Psalms 1 and 2, our God sits in the heavens and laughs at while the nations rage and plot vain things. Lord, you are everlasting to everlasting. We thank you that you never change. We thank you that we can trust your word with our very lives. It's impossible for you to lie, and you've made your pledge, and you uphold this word and this world by your own word. Lord, Cause your truth, the light of your truth, now to be shine on the inside of us as we read and as we go through the scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's read a little bit. Revelation 11, 1 through 4 again. Then I was given a read like a measuring rod and the angel stood saying to me rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship there but leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it for it has been given what has been given the court which is outside the temple it has been given to the Gentiles and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 40 two months. And I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days, or 42 months, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees, two lampstands, who stand before the God of the earth. Now, several weeks ago, we left you off. You should be left off on page, is it 30? Is that where we left you? Yeah. 30, I'm just going to give you the fill-ins on 30 to make sure you are up to speed here, especially the last ones. The last one should be, we've, we've talked about tread underfoot, which means the process of treading down. And we, we talked about, uh, in the middle of the page, so to be trodden underfoot is a symbolic expression, okay? So to be trodden underfoot is a symbolic expression. To be trodden down then is a symbolic of one's utter defeat, its crushing or subduing of all enemies to their humiliating defeat. So that, you got that on your notes? Okay, three, everybody's not sure where you're at. Okay, you got them? That's page 29? Okay, so is that better? <laughs> all right, so. What do we have here? We have the outer court. And we've spent a lot of time on this, so I won't review too deep on this, guys, because we've got to move along here. But the outer court and the people of Jerusalem are to be trodden down underfoot. It's a what? Total defeat, a humiliation, and a subjugation to the enemies of God and Christ. There are two expressions in the New Testament that need to be distinguished that some writers seem as one and the same thing. I do not. First one is... On the bottom, at least on my page here, on the bottom of uh, page 30, which is 29 apparently, the times of the Gentiles. The times of the Gentiles. That's your fill-in. The times of the Gentiles. And that's found in Luke 21 
at through 20 through 24. Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. That's, that, that's your first one. The second one is the fullness of the Gentiles. So we have the time of the Gentiles and the fullness of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles, Jesus, excuse me, the times of the Gentiles pertain to the rule and dominion of Jerusalem by Gentile power. The times of the Gentiles by many expositors understand that the times of the Gentiles over Jerusalem started with Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon in B.C. 606. This period ends, though, in the closing days of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have a time of the Gentiles and we have the fullness of the Gentiles. In this verse, in Revelation 11:2, Jerusalem is trodden under foot of the Gentiles for how long? For 42 months. It points to the fact that the times of the Gentiles began with Babylonian captivity and the desolation of Jerusalem and ends in Jerusalem at the coming of Christ with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Does that make sense to you? Sort of, kind of? Okay, what it's saying is there was the time of the Gentiles. It will end in the treading down of the holy city of the outer court and Jerusalem in the last three and a half years. Let me just say it that way, okay? So, we said it a couple weeks ago, just for those that are visiting, I'm coming from the premise that there is no seven-year tribulation because you can't find it in the book of sevens. In the ultimate book of sevens where there is 42 sevens mentioned in the book of Revelation, there is no seven-year tribulation. So I'm coming at it from a biblical, what I try to come from a scriptural perspective going, there's multiple mentions of 1260 days or 42 months or time, time, and half a time. Those all represent three and a half year time frames, okay? Nowhere do you see the adding of two time frames together, okay? And we said we're going to look at that in depth in Daniel chapter 9 because that's where the, uh, what's called the 70 week prophecy where we can begin to understand how some of these commentators started adding things where they can't actually, you have to do gymnastics to actually read that in the book of Revelation. And we're going to show where that is. When did Jesus get cut off? He got, uh, got cut off at what? At the end of three and a half years of ministry, didn't he? Okay? So if we're talking about a seven-year period, Christ didn't have a seven-year period. You would think that every person that understands that seven is God's number, and if Christ gets cut off in the midst of that number, that there's probably, and it's exactly half of that number, there's probably another half yet to be finished. So the reality would be, what's that finishing? a time of where there's certain things that are going to get trampled that are not going to be measured for the same amount of time that Jesus walked in Jerusalem. He gave the opportunity for three and a half years to turn to the Messiah. Now there's going to be another three and a half years that they can turn to the Messiah only under much different, difficult circumstances. Which does what? Makes the seven years, doesn't it? Yeah. Right? All right. So... In that process, the Apostle Paul then speaks to the fullness of the Gentiles. And this is different than the times of the Gentiles. The fullness is where we get Romans 11.25. Lest you be wise in your own conceits, I want you to understand this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now you can see right there by the language, if you choose to take times of the Gentiles and fullness of the Gentiles as one, it props up potentially the view that there is, they're one and the same. That when the time of the Gentiles is done, the fullness of the Gentiles is done. But that's not necessarily what the Bible's saying here. You can interpret it that way, and that's what a lot of expositors have done. 
but there's also a lot of expositors that don't interpret it that way, meaning that the time of the Gentiles is what Jesus talks about when the final treading of Jerusalem under feet of unbelieving people is over. The fullness of the Gentile means what? That God has finished a number or has now stopped his, if you will, his, uh, I'm going to say this carefully, his election of the Gentiles and now forces or moves his attention more toward the Jews. Two radically different perspectives. Not one and the same. Because right now, if you look at Romans 11, you'll understand that not all Israel is Israel. Right? You understand that it says that because of unbelief, branches were broken off, and now by nature, the wild olive tree is grafted into the natural olive tree, right? And he says, don't boast against the roots. Don't boast against if God is able uh, to put us and graft us in, is he not able to graft in the natural branches again? Of course he is. And, but I think it comes down to the picture of what there's a time of blinding that's been happening that allowed the fullnesses of the Gentiles to come in. And then when that door closes, it what? It opens a small door for that harvest for those there. And if you look at what's been happening in time, there's only a remnant of natural Israel that's been saved through the decades and the generations, just a small remnant. But as the years are, are moving forward, we're starting to see more than ever, inroads being made of Jewish people actually turning to the Messiah. In fact, it's probably in the last 10 to 15 years, mostly 10 years, great inroads have been made, <clears throat> not the normal way, but through video in the privacy of their own homes because of the, the Antichrist spirit that's there in the Orthodox and in the... Uh, absolute uh, atheist nature of many of the Israeli people. It's hard to believe, but most Israelis fall into two camps. They're either atheists or they're ultra-Orthodox, and both of them end up hating Christianity. That's the reality of the state of Israel. And organizations like One for Israel that, that we support here uh, and have over times and campaigns and uh, help build a Jewish church and an Arab church in Israel. Um, the reality is their campaigns do best through the video explaining Jesus the Messiah as the best gift you can give an Israeli. Jesus, that the best gift you can give them is Jesus, right? <laughs> there is no, you, you, I mean, food and some of those stuff is great, but we don't just do things to do things. There's a, there's a reason we support certain organizations, and I don't support other organizations. I don't just believe in, 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 and I say this carefully, I don't believe in just patronizing a Jewish person any more than I feel like patronizing an Arab-Palestinian person. Now, so the Apostle Paul says that Israel will have partial blindness until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. That means the truth is that God is taking out of the Gentiles a people for his name, and the church is comprised of believing Jews and believing Gentiles. That was the whole revelation of what God said to Peter. Rise, kill and eat. Don't you dare call unclean what I have said is clean. God is not going to undo how he set the table. He doesn't set the table for 2,000 years and say, ah, it was another dispensation. I'm done with the Gentiles now. Off to heaven with you. Now the real dinner is going to be with only my people. It doesn't work that way. We are his people. Those who believe in his name. That's what John, John fought for. He says, those not born by the will of man or by the, or by the desire of man, but were born by the will of God. Born again. Okay, so the fullness of the Gentile means what? Pertains to the salvation of the Gentiles. As soon as the number of Gentiles who are to be saved is complete, guess what? The fullness of the Gentiles ends. And I see it as a divine swap, if you will. 
It's not closing the door completely on the Gentiles. It's doing what? Where, where, the, where the Jewish people, in by and large, rejected the Messiah, and where the leaders and the, the people and the followers says, let his blood be upon our children and our children, the innocent blood of this crucifixion. We want nothing. That was the beginning message of Acts chapter 2, of Acts chapter 4. Peter said it over and over. You crucified the Messiah, although you did it in English. You, uh, you did it in ignorance. You put him to death. Peter didn't mince words with the Jewish people. You did it. And you said, let the innocent blood be upon us and upon our children and our children's children. You invoked that curse because what you thought you were doing, you wanted nothing to do with the Messiah. Well, guess what? That blindness, Paul talks about it, that blindness is still intact and it's only lifted, the veil is lifted in Christ. When the fullness of the Gentiles is complete, only God knows that number, right? God knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows how many are on dad's, how many are on mine and, 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 and Charlie's and there's a very small number. And then he knows how many hairs are on this man's head, which I'm not going to get covetous right now looking at that, okay? And so the reality is God knows that. He, he can count tears in a bottle. The Bible says he knows the number of tears that are in the bottle that we've cried. He's kept. He knows how to count things. He's God. Certainly he knows what number it is when the Gentiles reach a certain number when he's going to make a distinction of going, okay, now I'm lifting this veil because I need to bring the rest in. And so what I think is going to take place is why there's only been a remnant being saved all along. When that time frame switches, the, the predominant form of salvation will be a return of of, of Jewish natural people to Jesus like we've never seen before, and there will be very few salvations in the Gentile world, respectively. But there will be a time when it flops. It's the fullness of the Gentiles. God knows that number. We don't. He doesn't give us that number. Right? Okay? So, as soon as the number of Gentiles are to be saved and complete, then the fullness of the Gentiles ends. This period of time appears to reach its zenith at the conclusion of the beginning of the tribulation period. So everything that I've studied, everything we've moved so far up saying, the times of the Gentiles starts, or the, excuse me, the fullness of the Gentiles starts Revelation chapter 11. Why? Because there's ones that are getting measured at the altar there's those that are getting trodden underfoot and leave the court unmeasured, which is where, where the brazen altar would have been. And the brazen altar represents something outside the temple. It represents what? The cross. What gets trampled by people? The cross. And at the same time that Jerusalem is being trampled underfoot, and not, me not measuring anybody at the cross anymore, what's happening? God's two witnesses are coming in Old Testament power declaring who Jesus Christ is. You can't find any of their miracles in the New Testament authority as written in the scriptures. They're pulling now from what? Old Testament realities. You can look to Moses' ministry and Elijah's ministry and see that every miracle and plague that they're doing is in regard to an Old Testament mindset, not a New Testament mindset. Which means what? If you've rejected grace as a Jewish person, then the only way, if you won't accept grace, the only way that'll have to come back is you'll recognize how you've transgressed the law and through the plagues and the discipline, turn to what you missed. But the Gentile world wouldn't understand that. Because the Gentile world doesn't have an understanding of the law. But orthodoxy does. Are you there? Does that make sense? All right. So, God had promised to open the eyes of the Jewish people and to pour out the spirit of grace and supplication on the nation. They would mourn the rejected Son of God, their Messiah. That is Zechariah 12. There will come a time when they will mourn them who was their Messiah. Both of these periods then come to an end. That's your fill-in. Both of these periods come to an end. 
when the number of Gentiles are saved that are to be saved, then when God turns his face toward the Jewish people under the ministry of the two witnesses and blindness is lifted off the nation, the church age is basically the period of time in which God is visiting the Gentiles to take, them, to take out of them a people for his name in blessing while blindness is upon the Jewish nation. The time of the present vision of John is a time when blindness has been or is in the process of being lifted off and God's purposes are centered around the city of Jerusalem. Other scriptures would speak of being trodden down may be seen, and I give you all these scriptures. So it's, it's, it, it's two things unfolding in, in Revelation 11. It is the ending of a dispensation of the masses being saved in Revelation 11 of Gentiles and the opening of the eyes of those that have been under the blinders because they rejected a, a Jewish Jesus who went to the Gentile world only to be confronted with two witnesses who bring upon them everything that they said was superior than Jesus. The law of Moses and the disciplines of Elijah. Okay? So both happening at the same time. That's why I've said to you, Revelation 11 is the key pivotal chapter that moves Gentile world, Jewish world, and church world all at the same time. It's the chapter that begins to cut trenches in things coming to a close, to opening, and to protection of the church. Rather than the leaving of the church, it's the protection of the church, the persecution of those that aren't actually operating in covenant relationship with Christ and bringing back to the understanding of the people who Jesus the Messiah really was. Okay? You doing all right? All right, so Jerusalem will be the religious capital of the Antichrist. It will be under his domination and control and will be trodden under the foot of Gentile powder, pow, pow, powder, power. The outer court saints, remember we talked about this a few weeks ago. God said what? Measure the temple, the altar, and those who worship there. Those are inner court saints, aren't they? Those are the ones that actually believe in worshiping in spirit and truth and actually are praying and connected to the things of heaven. They are people that are ignited by the spirit of God. Then there's what? outer court Christians. They don't really have a deep relationship in prayer. They don't minister at the altar representing the candlestick, representing the Holy Spirit, representing communion, and have a love for it. They just want to know their sins are forgiven, but they have no relationship really. That's what gets trampled underfoot here. Doesn't mean that they're not saved, but it means they don't trust God with their protection. <laughs> now, I'll explain that. You, when it says measure the temple, what are we talking about? If you understood priestly ministry, it's what? You kept the lamps burning. What was the message to the foolish virgins? They didn't keep the lamps burning. Five wise and five foolish. Both what? Virgins. Virgins representing what? pure, chaste, holy, those that had been set aside for God. What did one set of virgins do? Five of the virgins did what? They lived to please the groom that was coming. What did the other five do? They didn't care about living to please. They didn't plan. They didn't live their life about bringing extra oil. They were all about what the groom would do for them. Five were for what the groom would do for them. Five were for of what they could do to meet the groom. Totally two different realms of people. Guess what happened? Five went in, 50% went in, and 50% got left out. Huh? Right, so... The, so the, no, not necessarily. What I'm saying is, that was the, what I'm saying is, it's a parable. You have to go to the fact of what do you do with the other. Two were grinding at the mill. One was taken, one was left. Two were asleep at night in the bed. One was taken, one was left. 
the traditional explanation of that under dispensationalism was what? It's that the Lord returned, took them out, and took them to heaven. I don't think that's accurate at all. I think it's the actual opposite. The ones that were taken were the ones that were taken in martyrdom. The ones that were left were the ones that were protected by the Lord. When you look at the scriptures here of what is trodden underfoot and what is actually preserved, it's the preservation. Because remember, during this time, for the same amount of time, 42 months, the real church, the believing church, not the, I shouldn't say the real church, the believing church that's the bride of Christ that's partnering with the Spirit of God, putting their trust in the whole Word of God, gets what? Gets wings in chapter 12 of eagles delivered into another place for time, time, and half the time, for 42 months. So that measurement of the real church gets protected. What happens over here? They weren't measured at the altar because they were never at the altar. They weren't measured at the golden lampstand because they didn't really want relationship with the Holy Spirit. What they wanted is they wanted brazen altar. Give me Jesus Christ's blood to forgive me of my sins and give me the brazen altar to wash my hands. But to, to actually operate in a spiritual dependence operate in the gifts of the Spirit, operate in communion, and spend my time in prayer, partnering with the now voice of God, I can tell you right now that way more than 50% of Christianity lives over here. But that doesn't mean they go to hell. But it also means they, they don't get... <laughs> okay, with what? Well, I'd like to believe that they're not. I mean, the possibility is that they could, but I think the... Well, John, but I'm, we're talking about what do you build with? Wood, hay, or stubble? Gold, silver, or precious stones? There are going to be a lot of Christians that have built with wood, hay, and stubble that will have nothing left to show for it but what? Salvation as a prize. Well, well you're... But now you're taking both sides of the coin. That's what I'm saying to you is, is the possibility, could that, be, could that be that they just get their life as a prize? Well, yeah, we have that in 1 Corinthians 3. So that's why I'm erring on that side rather than putting them all in the supreme jackpot. Okay? <laughs> all right. You guys doing okay? All right. <laughs> all right. What would, be my, what would be my thought on that? My thought is during that three and a half years of time, while the two witnesses are operating, that the outer court saints, so that's why I'm going to say, that I'm going to use the phrase, measured at the altar, temple saints, or if I will, lifestyle of the spirit saints versus outer court saints. Can I use those two terms? Lifestyle of the spirit saints, of those who depend and lives are are living for the Lord, they get preserved in my opinion. The outer court saints, this is where there's the great tribulation and martyrdom to go through. This is where, this is where the book of Daniel says, and the Antichrist makes war against them. He can't make war. You, you look at it in chapter 12, God opens up the earth and swallows all of the water coming out of the dragon's mouth against the preserved church. But he doesn't, he says that those who end up, there'll be some that will lose their lives. How do they lose their lives? Well, there might be a, some, there's great people that had godly faith that got martyred. But as we're looking at the 80-20 at the rule here, this will be 80% of those that have just taken Christ as a confession, but probably have not turned their whole life over to him. And it's my hope, it's my hope that in that mercy of the Lord, even in that state that they will be given their life as a prize. Okay? I believe that outer court saints will be martyred for their faith so as to fulfill the trotting down underfoot of the Antichrist and the Gentiles. That's what I think that means. But the times of the Gentiles are not yet fulfilled. Meaning what? 
but will be complete at the end of the 42 months. So as we move through Revelation 11 here, the beginning of the two witnesses and the measuring of that temple start, in my mind, a heavenly clock of three and a half years of Kairos moment. In those three and a half years is where you get Revelation 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 is in those three and a half years and 19 is the return of the Lord. So if I'm, if you, if you're, if, if, if I'm giving you my understanding here, how I look at that is what 11 gives us an overview of three different views. The, the church, unchurched, so to speak, the Jewish people under the retribution of the Lord of judgments and the protected church and the world. You have four categories of the Gentile world. In those four categories, then 12 through 18, those six chapters represent in those six chapters all three or four quadrants of everyone that, that God begins to focus in on. And you're going to see chapters for the church preserved, chapters for the world that has, that it falls under the power of the Antichrist, and, 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 and verses for those that, that might lose their life through tribulation and hardship. And you're going to find those pins in the next six chapters from Revelation 11. Does that make sense? Okay. You may not like it, but that's how it is. All right. 12, basically 11 through 18. Yeah. So the times of the Gentiles are not yet fulfilled, but we be completed at the end of 42 months. 42 months here is, again, a key period mentioned. 42 months, 1260 days, time, time, and half a time. So here are what we have on those, those, those scenarios. Ready? Two witnesses. Two witnesses minister for 1260 days or 42 months. In Revelation 12, verses 6 and 14, the woman is hidden in the wilderness from the serpent for what? Time, time, half a time, 42 months or 1260 days. What, also, what else happens? What else happens is, guess what? The beast reigns. The beast reigns for 42 months in addition. So I know I don't, I don't like the beast either. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you. Uh, so when you think about it, you've got the two witnesses ministering to the apostate, to the ones that have denied Jesus for 42 months. You've got the woman preserved church that's hidden for 42 months. And you have the beast now reigning in chapter Revelation 13 for how long? 42 months. Well, none of the expositions, they, they don't add the 42 months up each time and go, well, there's 42 months plus that 42 months plus that 42 months. So why would they be inconsistent with that and only add the three and a half and the three and a half? Does it work with that way? Yes. That's a good question. I, I, I don't know. But I don't think it was three and a half years. I don't think so. But I'd have to look. I'd have to, I'd have to go back and kind of figure out what month he left and what month he got back and yeah. Yeah. It, that's a good, great, great question. I just don't know right off the top of my head, Dennis. Good question. All right. So, huh? Yes, he was. Yes, he was. And to, my, to that point, I would say that's exactly what I'm talking about as the church was hidden in the wilderness for time, time, and half a time. Absolutely. Okay? So, here's, here's, here's what they all point to. They all point to the one in the same period. They're happening all at the same time, just to different groups of people at the same time. Okay? Um... Let me, let me move forward and then we're right at the end because we're, we're finishing right here. 
my understanding is this period of time is all speaking to the same months and is referring to the final half of Daniel's 70-week prophecy. And because of that, it positively places this time at the end of the present of this present age. Revelation is showing what the 70-week prophecy is not completed history, but is the final half of prophecy. What dispensationalism does is it tries to say that Revelation chapter 9, excuse me, Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 27 or 8 is completed history. I'm going to submit to you as we go through it that it's not completed history, that it is yet to be completed just like Joel chapter 2. When Peter quoted Joel chapter 2, he says what? I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Sons and daughters shall prophesy. Old men shall dream dreams. Young men shall see visions. I will pour my spirit out on men servants and maid servants. He only gave half the prophecy. What's the second prophecy? And there will be fire and smoke and blood in the heavens. And, and he moves through this whole wrath side of things. That's the rest of that prophecy. Joel 2 is yet to be fulfilled. It's not completed history. It's had its first part that has been released for 2,000 years, but we're waiting for the second part of the last part of Joel 2 to come to pass. Earth, you know, blood, smoke, fire in the heavens and the signs of God's wrath. That's yet to be completed. So we have lots of scriptures that have this partial completion that are cut off in the middle and yet waiting for the final completion. Another one would be Isaiah, 60, Isaiah 61. Jesus left off at the half of the verse. He didn't say, and the vengeance of the Lord our God. He left that part out. He said what? That it would be what? Uh, that, that um, I'm trying to quote it by memory here. Uh, da, 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 that oh Charles help me what is it uh, it's not the times of refreshing will come I've got the Acts chapter 3 in my head it is that times of restoration would come from the Father not times of refreshing but that the restoration the times of restoration would come the last part of the verse says and the, day, and the days of vengeance of our God <laughs> the days of vengeance are what the summing up of the judgment of all things so, so Isaiah 61 has a part A and a part B. We're never to operate in the part B of things. That's reserved for the God things. But we're called to be partners in the part A of doing what? We are anointed by God to preach the gospel, to heal in his name, to deliver in his name, to, to bind up the brokenhearted in his name. But we're not to do what? Bring vengeance. Why? Because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, I will repay. It's never our job to do that. So Christ stopped short of saying, this is what's on me. The vengeance wasn't on him at that period of time, so he didn't say it. Because what was on him is to be on us. He gets the privilege of bringing the vengeance to sum up things on our behalf. We never get to operate in that. Yeah. Have you noticed that? Notice he kills the Antichrist with the breath of his mouth. Notice that when he comes to the church to correct, he said to Sardis and some of these, he said, you'll not know when I fight against you with my words. There, there, there is something to the fact about these prophetic words that God opens up half of it and waits for the second half. Well, that's the picture. He opened up half of it when he inaugurated the church and we're waiting for the second half when he brings the consummation to Christ finishing the full work. We are saved, we will be saved, right? We've been justified, we will be justified. It is the principle of, yes, we have it spiritually, but then we will have it in totality. And that's why I, I think it's important when you then look at this, I think you have this chart on your notes. The phrases of the vision of, of coming here in, in, in Revelation 11. What are the spiritual lessons of the vision? versus the phrases of the vision. The phrases is, the phrases are, the temple is measured. Which means what? The church will be measured at the end of the age. You can't read Revelation 
2 and 3 about the seven churches and not see that Jesus is measuring his church according to a divine standard of which he rebukes them for not measuring up. Number two, the altar of incense is measured, which means what? The ministry of prayer will be measured on who is actually praying the will of the Father. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's one thing to quote it, it's another thing to actually pray it. Quoting the prayer, can I say this carefully without you taking it as, as blasphemy? Quoting the prayer is not praying the Lord's prayer. Jesus was giving the topics in every single one of those things. He was giving topics in which the disciples were to operate in the spirit of those topics. So when he said, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, it wasn't just a statement. It was a point to begin to pray what it means to worship the name. To take more time than just saying, hallowed be thy name. Now I'm not saying it doesn't count. What I'm saying is, that prayer is way deeper than what most people have said and just recorded it in church and say, well, I prayed the Lord's Prayer. No, no, no. When you say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that's not just a statement. That means you actually yielding to the kingdom coming through you and God's will moving through you versus your own. That's what's going to be measured. Not that you just repeated something. See, that's the great fallacy. If I, I know I'm getting real serious here at the end here. That's the great fallacy that people that just repeated parroted prayers by the hundreds of thousands didn't actually put their faith and put themselves in it. They just parroted a sense of words. It's the difference between ministering at the altar, which actually means ministering, versus being an echo. Are you going to have a voice to partner with the Holy Spirit and with God, or are you going to be an echo? In my opinion, all the echoers are going to be out in the outer court. And those that really have the voice of God ministering in and through them are the ones that get measured. I know that's a little deep. I know it's a little, yes, Yeah, you could say that. That would be part of it. Yeah. Okay? I'm out of time. I, John got me all fired up. Hallelujah. Sorry, it's John's fault. No, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> I'm kidding you. Uh, let me pray for you. We finished that, so here's what we're going to do. Next week, we're going to hit the, the new section of notes here. Um, and so that's going to be good. Amen? All right. Jesus. <laughs> Bless this class for enduring me. Thank you, Lord. I ask you to just be with them. Give them traveling mercies. Thank you for, Lord, their patience and kindness. Lord, in all things, let us honor you with sincerity and truth. And Lord, never take you for advantage. Lord, we believe in pure relationship. Lord, a relationship with Jesus is what matters not the religion of it. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, God bless you guys. Have a great evening. We'll see you back this weekend.